Isaiah 61. <laughs> Isaiah 61. We spent the entire summer in the Psalms, and I think I just got programmed for going back to the Psalms. Isaiah 61. Charles is back there freaking out, like, did I give him the wrong text? Um, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to frame liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. What we just read are prophetic words about the role of Jesus that he would play when he was on the earth. These were words that were uttered by the prophet Isaiah almost 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah prophesied here in our text that Jesus would bring good news to the poor. Number two, that he would bind up the brokenhearted. And number three, he would open the prison to those, for those who are bound. This morning, we're beginning a new series um, called um, More Than Ordinary. And the premise of this series is we're going to be looking at characters from the Old Testament, characters that had flaws and characters that um, had all sorts of issues, but, but there was a God who used them in powerful ways. And through that, we want to be able to see that even our lives, as broken as we are, that God could use for his glory and honor. But the other premise behind this is we want to look at these characters and we want to look forward from their lives and see how each of these characters were pointing toward Jesus and how ultimately Jesus becomes the true and better character that we're studying, the true and better Adam, the true and better Noah, the true and better Moses or David, that Jesus is the ultimate hero of our faith. And so we're going to look at heroes that we love and we're going to look at characters that we might have never studied and through that hopefully point our way to see how Jesus is so much better and greater. But as we begin, I wanted to begin with laying the foundation down of understanding who Jesus is. Because even if we point all of these characters toward Jesus, if we don't understand who Jesus is, we're going to have a flaw in our faith. And so what I want to propose to you this morning is that we need to have a proper understanding of who our Savior is, or we'll be deficient in our walk with God. We'll have struggles in our walk because we have a deficient view of Jesus in our lives. Walk outside these doors, talk to people, ask them, who do you think Jesus is? And you will find out that there will be a variety of answers about who Jesus is and the role that he plays in our lives. I don't know if you guys remember, but several years ago, there was a movie that came out called Talladega Nights. Um, it was starring Wolf Ferrell, um, and I wanted to show a clip from the video, but there was just, we'd have to beep out several parts of it, and it just wasn't appropriate for church. But I, So I'm going to highlight one part of that movie where Ricky Bobby, who um, Wolf Ferrell plays, um, him and his family get together for dinner, and they are about to pray. And at the dinner table is Ricky. Um, Ricky is this um, NASCAR driver who's just this incredible success. And it's his, at the table is Ricky, his wife Carly, his two kids Walker and Texas Ranger, um, his father-in-law Chip, and his racing partner Cal. And they gather together for dinner. And before they begin, Ricky, um, Ricky begins to say grace. And let me read you the words um, of what he says. And here's how he begins. He says, Dear Lord, baby Jesus, or as our brothers in the South call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take a moment to thank you for my family, my two beautiful, beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR as we call them, and of course for my red-hot smoking wife, and I also want to thank you for my best friend and teammate, Cal, who's got my back no matter what. And he continues, he says, Dear Lord, baby Jesus, we also want to thank you for my wife's father, Chip. We hope that you can use your baby Jesus superpowers to heal him and his horrible leg. And it smells terrible, and the dogs are always bothered by its smell. Dear tiny infant Jesus, we, 
And then all of a sudden, his wife interjects and says, Sweetie, you know Jesus grew up, right? You know that he wasn't always a baby. You don't have to call him a baby. And then Ricky responds. He says, I like Christmas Jesus the best. And I'm the one saying grace. When you say grace, you can say grace to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whatever Jesus you want to pray to. And so he continues. He says, Dear tiny Jesus, in your golden fleece diapers, with your tiny little fat, balled-up fists. And then his father-in-law gets mad, and he goes, he was a man. He had a beard. And then Ricky looks up and says, look, I like baby version the best. I win the races. I make the money. I put the food on the table. I like this Jesus the best. And all of a sudden, his team partner joins in and says, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt. Because that says to me, I want to be formal, but I also want to party too. Because I like to party, and I want my Jesus to party with me. And now the kids are interjecting and says, I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. Cal jumps back in and says, I like to think of Jesus with like giant eagle wings. And he's singing lead vocals for like an angel band. And I'm in the front row, and I'm hammered drunk. And now Carly, the wife, is just mad and upset, and she goes, just finish the prayer already. And Ricky says, okay, dear, eight pound, six ounce, newborn infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant and so cuddly, but still omnipotent. How he figured that word out amazes me. Um, We just thank you for all these races that I won and the $21.2 million in my bank account, and the whole family just lets out a woo. Um, We love that money that I've accrued over this past season. Thank you for all of your power and all of your grace, dear baby Jesus. Amen. I look at you, and some of you guys hear that, and you find that comical, um, and some of you guys find that offensive. Um, But I bring that out because the scene is a reminder of the temptation that we face to kind of fashion Jesus into our own image. There is a very serious danger that we have to make Jesus into the Jesus that we want, the Jesus that we like. And let's be honest, there isn't a more critical time in society where we need to make sure that our understanding of Jesus is what the scriptures teach. So you know you've remade Jesus into your own image if the Jesus that you serve hates all the people that you hate. You know you made Jesus into your own image if that Jesus will not hang out with the people that you would not hang out with. And that can be Muslims, that can be Jews, that can be homosexuals, that can be liberals, that can be fundamentals, that can be Democrats, that can be Republicans, That can be anyone that you don't like. If that Jesus doesn't like them, then you know you've made Jesus into your image. You know, if that Jesus hates them, you've got a twisted view of Jesus. And what I want to do this morning is to dig into Scripture and for us to consider the possibility that maybe our view of Jesus isn't exactly lined up to Scripture. i like to take you this morning through a small journey to examine what the scriptures teach, especially what the prophet Isaiah says about who Jesus is. Normally when we preach up here, we're taking passages of scripture and we're going verse by verse and studying, but this morning is a little bit more topical, so it's a little bit more different. I'm going to quote a lot of scriptures to you. It's not in your notes. You can write them down and um, read them later, but I want to make sure that as a church we understand who Jesus is and the Jesus that we worship is the Jesus of the Bible. And so this morning we'll see that some of us are going through struggles in our faith because we have a deficient view of Jesus. We have a false view of Jesus. So I've got to begin by asking, do you really know who Jesus is? Do you really understand who this 100% man and 100% God, but in the same person, do you really understand who this man is? See, there might be some of you in this room that struggle to believe in Jesus But you run with a group of friends and family that are all followers of Jesus, and 
you will never in your wildest dreams share with them the honest frustrations that you have with your walk with God. Your view of Jesus is so inadequate to compel you to believe that when I tell you that truth compels you to believe that 2 plus 2 is 4, not 5, not 3, it's as simple as that. You, it's hard for you. But because of your worldview and because you don't see Jesus as portrayed by scriptures, as per scriptures portrayed him to be, because you, it causes you to be a person that lives half in the church. You will come to church, you'll worship, you'll do this church stuff, but you're also fully engaged in doing the stuff of the world, stuff that contradicts everything that Jesus teaches and everything that Jesus is about. John Calvin, the reformer, looked at this text that we read, and he broke it down and he said that when you read this text, you can see Jesus being portrayed as three different roles or three different offices. First of all, you could see Jesus as a prophet. He brings good news to the poor. He's a prophet. Secondly, he's a priest. He binds the brokenhearted. He's our priest. And finally, he's our king. He brings liberty to the captives. What I want to do this morning is present to you that this Jesus that we worship is called to be our prophet. He's called to be our priest. He's called to be our king. And I want to show you that if there is a deficiency or confusion in your mind in any of those three areas, it will leave you giving to things that are ultimately have no meaning or no value, and you will wear yourself out and you will burn yourself out, and at the end of the day, you'll get frustrated. So what I want to do is I want to look at all three of these things and show you what these offices mean and how Jesus fulfills them. And then what I want to do is at the end, make this all practical. So the beginning, there's a lot of theology. And those of you guys who love theology, you're going to get excited about this. And those of you who don't, bear with me. But this is truth for you to know because it's so important. And, and then at the end, we'll bring it all together and show you how this is all practical. So the first thing, Jesus is our prophet. Jesus is our prophet. What does it mean to say that Jesus is our prophet? In the Old Testament, the role of the prophet, there was two things that the prophet was supposed to do. Number one, he was supposed to reveal truth about God to us. He was supposed to reveal truth about God to us. And secondly, the role of the prophet is to tell us how we are to live in the presence of God. One, he is supposed to reveal God to us. And two, he's supposed to tell us how we're supposed to live in the presence of God. A prophet shows us who God is. A prophet will reveal to the people, this is God. This is the God that you are called to serve. This is the God that is, called, that is calling you to love him and follow you. But a prophet will also show you how God expects you to live. And if you don't live this way, the prophet will tell you that there is pending judgment that is coming your way. In Isaiah 55, Isaiah prophesies that Jesus would function in the role of a prophet. And when you read the New Testament, you find several different statements about Jesus functioning as a prophet. It said that Jesus revealed more to us about God than any of the Old Testament prophets combined. And there's a whole bunch of statements. In Hebrews 1, the author says that all that we've heard about God, all that the prophets told us, all that we read in the Old Testament, not, none of that compares to Jesus, because in Jesus, we have a more clearer image of God than we've had ever before. In Matthew 11, Jesus says that the role of the Son, that his role is to disclose who the Father is. The role of the Son is to reveal who God is. And that's exactly what Jesus does. See, those of us in this room who know Jesus, those of us in this room who love Jesus, you're actually seeing him through the eyes of the Father. In the book of John, verse Chapter 14, Jesus makes a statement that he cannot even speak unless the Father allows him to speak. He can only speak what the Father tells him to speak. In another passage, he says that he can only do what the Father tells him to do. There is such a role in Jesus that when he became a man and when he shows up, what he said and what he did reveals to us who God is. Jesus is our prophet revealing to us who God the Father is. But Jesus doesn't just reveal to us who God is. He also shows us how we are called to live if we are part of his kingdom. 
We did an entire series on this last year when we did the Sermon on the Mount, but the entire Sermon on the Mount was consistently talking about, you heard in the Old Testament it was written like this, but I tell you this. You heard the prophets of old say this, but I'm calling you to a much better standard. I'm calling you to a much higher standard. You want to be my disciples? Then here is my expectations of you. You heard that this is how you were supposed to live? My expectations for you are even greater than what you've heard. You heard that the wor- you, you heard the world teach you this? But listen, the world hasn't even taught you anything compared to what I'm about to teach you. The world says don't commit adultery. I say don't even look at a woman lustfully. My standards are higher. See, Jesus shows us who God is, but he also reveals to us how God expects us to live. Jesus is our prophet who reveals to us God. See, sometimes something happens when we come to worship, when we come to God. Jesus will reveal to us the character of God so that when we worship, we worship because Jesus has revealed the Father to us. And then he shows us how we're expected to live because we are part of his kingdom. Jesus is our prophet. Number two, Jesus is our priest. In the Old Testament, the priest had two major objectives. One of it was positive. The other one was negative. On a positive side, the priest would go before the people, and he would go before God for the people, and he would offer sacrifices to God that would cause God to give you things that you did not deserve. The priest would make these sacrifices before God, and God would give you things you did not deserve. We have a word for that. It's called grace. The priest stood between us and God, and because he stood there, God gives us grace. See, when a priest would fulfill that role, Not because of you, not because of me, not because of my abilities or my giftings, but because of what God told him to do. He actually creates harmony between me and God. He causes us to be in relationship again, and he causes God to give you things that you don't deserve, things like salvation, things like a new life, a new beginning, a new name. All of these things, we don't deserve them. We didn't have the right to them, but he gives us those things because of grace. He causes God to give us these things. He gives us grace. That's the positive. But on the negative side, when we fall, when we sin, when we mess up, the priest would go and make sacrifices of animals to God, causing God to withhold something from us. When these priests would make these sacrifices, God would withhold wrath and judgment from us. We have a word for that. It's called mercy. We should receive judgment. We should receive damnation. We should receive the worst that God could give us. But because of mercy, God withholds it from us. We don't get it. All of us deserve damnation. All of us deserve hell. All of us deserve no blessings from God. But God, in his mercy, withholds his wrath and anger toward us. Grace, by definition, is God giving you things that you don't deserve. Mercy, by definition, is God withholding from you things that you do deserve. See, as a priest, Jesus actually does both of these things for us. He ultimately fulfills the role of the priest by allowing God to put God's wrath on himself. Jesus, on the cross, says, Father, put it on me. Put the wrath that you were going to put on them Take all of it and put it on me. Let me bear it. Let me experience the wrath that they should have deserved. Let me experience the condemnation they should have gotten. Let me receive the punishment that they should have got. And then, God, when you pour it all out on me, I want you to treat them as you would have treated me. I want you to treat them as if they lived my life, blameless, perfect, as if they've never sinned, as they were perfect from the moment of birth. And I want you to pour on them love and favor, and I want you to reside in them, and I want you to be their God, and I want you to be able to call them children. See, Jesus fulfills the role of the priest when he gives us grace and when he gives us mercy. 
See, this morning, if you're a child of God in this room, understand that it is only possible because, Jesus, because God allowed Jesus to be treated as if he lived your life. And so that now God can look at you and treat you as if you lived the life that Jesus lived. Jesus is our priest. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that God does not treat me based on my sins and based on my flaws, but that he gives me grace and mercy every single day. What a gracious and merciful God we serve. He is our priest. And number three, he's our king. The Bible teaches that Jesus is our king, that he comes to set the prisoner free. See, the role of the king is to sovereignly govern his kingdom, to rule over his kingdom. And Jesus does that in several different ways. We see in Scripture that his name, number one, is sovereign. The Bible teaches that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. See, that doesn't matter if you're black or you're white or you're Hispanic or Chinese or Korean or Indian or mixed or whatnot. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Jew, a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or an atheist or an agnostic. It doesn't matter. Every knee will one day bow at the name of Jesus. Jesus says it's going to happen. That also reveals to us that in his name, Jesus is a king. It also means that his name is above every other name, and in his name we see the authority of Jesus. But we also see the authority of Jesus and the kingship of Jesus in his, in his power. In Acts 2, 22, you see that if you had lived during the times of Jesus, you would have, been, you would have seen him do things like raising the dead. You would have seen him heal the sick. You'd have seen him sitting on a boat and calming a storm just by speaking a few words. You would have seen him feeding multitudes of people with five loaves and two fishes. The Bible says that all of these acts that Jesus did terrified the people. In fact, terrified his own disciples. His power was an amazing demonstration that Jesus reigned over everything. This man made and God made. He can reign over whatever we do in our lives, and he can rule and reign over creation. He ruled over all of it. And number three, he, we see his kingship and his authority. The Bible teaches that we see his kingship in the authority of Jesus. We see in Colossians 1, verse 16 and 17, where it says that Jesus is the vehicle through which the earth is created. He made it. The Father didn't make the earth. The Father made the blueprint, but the Son made it. In verse 17, it says that in Christ, all of this is held together. In Christ, this entire world is held together. Everything that we see is actually held together by Christ. What this means is that your life functions according to his control. Ephesians 1 says that all things work together according to the purpose of his will. All things. He's our prophet, he's our priest, he's our king. Some of you have loved ones who are sick. Some of you are struggling to find a job. Some of you are discouraged by everything that's going on in society and in the world. Some of you are struggling in school and it just started. Some of you are wondering what your future holds and you wonder how in the world can this God be in control of all of it? But the scripture says he is. And you've got to ask the question, why? And the answer is because Jesus is our king. In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, Jesus makes the statement. He says, all authority has been given to me. Every authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, therefore, because I have all authority, because I am in control, you can go. You can live your life. You can do the things I'm calling you to do. Why? Because I've got authority. See, we don't go in our own power. We don't go in our own might. We go with the authority of Jesus. We go under his command. He has given us authority in heaven 
and on earth. He's our prophet, our priest, and king. And all three of those are equally important. All right, now let's get very practical. I want to take a moment very quickly and show you what happens if you are deficient in any one of those areas. What happens if you believe two of those, but you don't believe one? How that affects your life. So let's assume that Jesus is your prophet. You believe that he reveals God to you. You believe that the scriptures tell you how to live. So you obey scriptures and you follow everything that the Bible teaches. And let's also assume that you believe Jesus is your king. You believe that he's in control of your life. You believe that nothing happens to you outside of his plans and purposes. You believe you're walking in the power and the authority of God. You believe that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. But let's assume that you don't believe that Jesus is your priest. In other words, your understanding of what Jesus did on the cross for you is very ambiguous and very vague, and you don't want to dive into deep theological discussions because you've met Christians who are theological junkies, right? All of us have met people like that. And all they love to do is argue theology, and they get weird, and they think football is a sin, and they think deodorant is a sin, and they think dancing is sin, and they think smiling is sin, or playing instruments and worship is sin, and the list can go on and on and on. But they're weird, and you don't want to be associated with them. So you believe Jesus is your prophet, and you believe Jesus is your king, but you have this hard time grasping and understanding the work of the cross and what Jesus did for you. You don't see him as your priest. See, what happens there is that you end up becoming a legalist. You end up becoming legalistic. See, the reason that you'll lean toward legalism is that you'll actually see everything that Jesus is telling you to do. You'll see everything that the scriptures teach, and you're doing it, and you'll look at scriptures, and you see that you're following everything the Bible says. You believe that he is in control of the world. You believe he's the ruler of the world, and because you don't need Jesus as your priest, you will believe that you are good enough to be judged by God and found innocent. You will think that because you go to church or because you pray or because you tithe or because you do all of these good things for God that when you stand before God on judgment day, your response to God will be, God, look at all of these things I did for you. Look at all of this money I gave for you. Look at how many Sundays I went to church. I did this all for you. And God will look at you and say, worthless absolutely worthless. You didn't view Jesus as your priest. And here's the danger. You will become dependent on yourself and your abilities. I didn't pray enough, so I need to pray more this week, so God will approve me. I didn't go to church this week, so I've got to do more good things, so God will accept me. You'll become overconfident in the things that you do. You'll be focused on doing good things so that you can make it to heaven and God will accept you. And in the end, you will not be humble enough because you didn't need a priest to either give you the grace of God or withhold the wrath of God in his mercy. Some of you in this room are exposed and struggling because you don't see Jesus equally as your priest. So you become regimented, legalistic in your view toward other Christians. You're critical of other people. You get angry when they don't serve as much as you serve. You get proud that you do more than other people. You keep patting yourself on the back because of all the good things that you do. And you sit and you're constantly finding fault in other people. See, because for the most part, you're like the Pharisees in the New Testament. They didn't need Jesus to die. They had all of their good works, and they thought that was good enough for God. In fact, they couldn't wait for Jesus to die. He was like a little booger that they were just trying to flick off of their fingers. And they became legalistic because they didn't see that they needed Jesus' grace and his mercy. When you don't view Jesus as your priest, you become legalistic. Let's switch it around. Let's try a different combination. You believe Jesus is your priest that he gives you grace and mercy. You also believe he's your prophet, that you realize the scriptures call you how to live, but you don't see him as your king. See, what that makes you is this is deep. I couldn't find a better word for this. See, if you don't view him as your king, it makes you a wimp. 
It's the deepest theological word I could find for this line. It makes you a wimp. You have no courage. You live defeated lives because you actually expect culture to beat you up. You actually expect the culture and the world to treat you like the evil stepsister that you think you are because you think that God is not in control of the world that you live in. Why? Because Jesus is not your king. So the things that you dream about are too small. You don't engage in things that are of significant value for the kingdom. You just simply go through the routines of going to church, but you never dream that God could save your loved ones. In fact, you never even pray that God would save your loved ones. Why? Because in the back of your mind, you don't believe that God could do that stuff. You don't believe that God can make a change or make a difference in your life. You don't view him as your king. I was in India last month, and we spent two days with a ministry that works in the heart of Mumbai. We've had people from our church that have gone to work with Bombay Teen Challenge before, and this ministry, they work in the heart of Mumbai, rescuing women and children off the streets that were sold into sex trafficking. They go right deep into the heart of this red light district. They find women. They rescue them. In fact, they even started a church in the heart of the red light district, and owners of brothels are coming to um, this church and getting saved. Me and Anne went to a camp, um, went to their camp where they take these women after they're rescued, and we saw the school that this ministry built. There were 72 children in that school, some of the most happiest faces I've ever seen in my life. We walked in, and our baby was with us, and they were just happy and excited to see us. And we realized that just maybe months or years ago, these kids were on the streets. Their moms were being sold as sex slaves. We met teachers at the school, and I was asking them, like, hey, how long have you been with BTC? And they're like, I grew up in BTC. And I'm like, what does that mean? And they were explaining, 20, 30 years ago, BTC came in to the red light district, rescued my mom and me out of the red light district. And they put me through school, put me through college. Now I'm coming back to teach other children. I was blown away. Some of you guys, a couple weeks ago, my wife was handing out bracelets, um, and you got that from her. Those bracelets were created or made by women that were rescued off the streets. This ministry will take these women and teach them how to do basic accounting skills, teach them how to sew, teach them how to do jewel, um, make jewelry, and then they sell it so that these women, once they're rescued off the streets, they find other jobs so that they could survive and live and take care of their children. And in talking, the next day I got to meet the founder. I've been talking to him and hearing about the challenges that he's facing, especially from the government. Not because they're doing a bad thing, but simply because they're followers of Jesus. The government wants to stop them. The founder made a comment that the reason they do this is because they know that this is what Jesus would be doing. Because this is where Jesus' heartbeat is. That he is passionate about setting people free from bondage. And he said that he had a dream that there would be a day that BTC wouldn't exist. Why? Because he is believing that God would transform that city and there would be a day that sex trafficking would no longer exist in that community. And he knows that the only way that would happen is if God intervenes. See, that's understanding that Jesus is your king. And I contrast that with our lives. How many of you get angry when you're stuck on traffic at 75, right? Or 635, or we get upset and all bent out of shape when we get sick and miss a day of work or our entire days can be ruined if someone says something to us that we don't like and we act like the world is going to fall apart. Can I suggest to you that he's not your king? I look at places like India and China and South America and I hear miracles happening in entire villages and towns coming to Jesus in the midst of the most horrible persecution you can imagine. But these people are bold and courageous to proclaim the gospel even if it costs them their lives. I look at Syria and Iraq where brothers and sisters are being beheaded for the sole fact that they love Jesus, nothing else. 
And even when they're given the option to renounce Jesus and live, they choose to say, you know what, I am not renouncing my Savior, and they will give their lives for it. Why? Because they understand that Jesus is their king. And I look and I pull back and I say, God, why aren't you doing that here? Why don't we have that boldness and courage here in this nation? Why don't we have that boldness and courage as a church? Why is it that we are so comfortable in our faith that it's okay for us to be a Christian on Sunday, but then do our own thing Monday through Saturday? It's because he's not our king. It's because he's not our king. Let me be real with you. Most of us don't need Jesus at our jobs. Most of us can simply live our lives on our own without Jesus because we aren't dreaming anything big. We aren't expecting great things from God. We're not believing that God has a plan and a purpose for us. So you can go to your jobs and do your jobs and never bring Jesus into the equation. You can go to class and never bring Jesus into the equation. You can raise your family and never bring Jesus into the equation because you don't view him as your king. You don't view Jesus as someone that can completely transform your society and your world because he lives inside of you. See, one of the biggest confessions I'll make One of the biggest challenges I have in being in ministry is doing church and service is that I can get up here week after week whether God shows up or not. Because I have been doing this long enough to know how the flow goes. I know what we need to do and how we need to do it. That I can actually get up here and speak and we can sing and do all these things and not be dependent on God with our lives. One of the biggest dangers we'll make in our lives is that we will wake up and we'll step out of our beds and that we think we can actually live our lives without God, without Him. Because we got it down. Because we got our routine down. So you can do your faith because it doesn't extend to a place where Jesus actually needs to come into it. Your relationships don't need Jesus in it. Your jobs keep Jesus out of them. Maybe that suggests to us that we have a weak Jesus in our head, that we don't see him as being able to work in the various arenas of our lives. Last equation. You believe Jesus is your king, that he's in control of your life. You view him as your priest, that you need his grace and mercy, but you struggle to understand him as your prophet. You don't allow him to speak into your life. The word for that is you become cultic. And here's the reason why. So you believe in a big God, but you kind of get an attitude. See, I know people who are too bold for their own good. They trust that God has forgiven them and extended grace and mercy to them, but they don't trust Jesus enough to explain to them the character of God. They don't trust Jesus enough to tell them how they're supposed to live. So they have this distorted view of Jesus that causes them to live in little communes and act and talk weird and basically make all the rest of us look bad because of the way they behave. See, what happens is that instead of listening to Jesus, you take ideas from people that you know and you kind of construct this... um, Mr. Potato Head type of Jesus, right? You like this about God, so I'll take that. And you like this about God, so I'll take that. But I don't like this part about God, so I'm going to ignore that. And I don't like this, what the Bible says about Jesus here, so I'm going to ignore that. And so you make Jesus into what you want him to be. See, the problem is that there's nowhere in Scripture that allows you to pick and choose what part of God you can have and what part of God you don't have. So you don't allow Jesus to tell you how to live. So you can actually come to church and worship God for giving you grace and mercy. You can worship God for extending his love towards you. And you can worship God because he's in control of your life and giving you jobs and homes and families and bless you more ways than you can imagine. And then you can walk out of these doors and live just like everyone else lives and act like everyone else acts and talk like everyone else acts because you've not seen Jesus as your prophet to tell you how God expects you to live. You've not allowed him to tell you how to live. We know people like that. 
people that can go through the motions of church and then live lives completely contrary outside of the church. We've got a word for them. We call them hypocrites. And can I suggest to you it's because they don't view Jesus as their prophet. See, some of you are living lives where your faith in Jesus has never produced what it was intended to produce. Maybe it's because you view him as king and you view him as priest, but you don't listen to him. And when preaching starts to meddle with how you live your life, when preaching starts to meddle with what you do with your body, when preaching starts to meddle with your language and your attitude and your idols in your life, you won't let Jesus talk to that because that's an area of your life that you don't want Jesus involved in. You will not let him to be your prophet. You live just like everyone else and no one else knows you're a follower of Jesus. Some of you in this room have friends who have never been to church and it's very doubtful that they even know you go to church. Listen, please understand, I'm not bashing you. But if we're going to be a church that is effective in reaching the city of Richardson, then we need to live lives that reflect Jesus. We do. I say that to me. I say that to you. And I say that with absolute humility. If we are going to be effective, we need to be reflecting on who our Savior is. See, sadly, the biggest distortion in this room is that a lot of us are legalists. We're people who really don't understand the priestly role of Jesus. We go to church, we do the things the Bible tells us to do, we got the routine down, that we come to the point where we actually don't need him anymore. It's indicative and manifested to you because of your meanness to other people. You're harsh, you're condescending, you look down on others because they're not at the same spiritual level that you're at. Don't you realize that it's only because of the grace of God that you are where you're at? So why do you pull other people down? Why do you attack other people? Why don't you pray that God reveals grace to them instead of condemning them and judging them? Why don't you pray that God will reveal his love toward them instead of pulling them down even further away from Jesus? It's been years since you've led anyone to Christ. If that, it's because you're like a Pharisee and you don't need Jesus as your priest. See, there's an amazing complexity to all of this because the way that I was brought up and the way that I was taught and trained inclines me in certain ways that causes me to say that if this is true, then I need to be careful in some areas that I may easily overlook if I'm not diligent. See, all of us, if we're truthfully honest, will say that there are some areas that we can easily be pulled toward if we're not diligent and careful. Whether that's becoming a legalist and condescending toward other people, or whether that's becoming a wimp and you simply live your life and the power of God is never revealed in your life, or whether it's that you come in here and do one thing and then walk out and do a completely different thing. All of us need to be careful. All of us do. All of us need to assess where we're at because when we do that and when we ask him to be our prophet and priest and king equally, God will do some amazing things through us. We're about to enter into a time of communion. And let me invite you that this would be a time where you would say that, God, even though I've heard these ideas of Jesus as my prophet and priest and king before, that today I would freshly apply it to my life. So that there are areas of deficiency in my life. I'm going to invite you to ask Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'd invite you to repent and join me in repentance. I'm pleading with you, put Jesus to the test. And see what he would do in your life when you come with a broken heart. See if he begins to shape a life in you that's more consistent with what you initially expected when you first came to Jesus. A life that's full of power and authority and grace and love. See if he will do that in you. The way that we do communion here at Love City, we allow you to meditate on the words of the message for a little while. The worship team will sing. They'll lead us in worship. 
So I'm going to invite you to just spend some time with Jesus. Maybe this morning the Holy Spirit is convicting you in one area or the other. Would you just spend some time with him? And when you are done, I'm going to invite you to come. There are elements on either side of the sanctuary, bread that represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us, juice that represents the blood that was shed for us. Would you come acknowledging he's my prophet, he's my priest, he's my king. Spend some time before Jesus, and whenever you're ready, you're welcome to grab the communion element, and I'll come back up here and we'll partake of the communion. Let's worship.